AutosportRadio.com 2023 show. I'm your host, Don Kay, and we are coming to you from Green Street Pub and Eatery, 911 North Green Street in Brownsburg. Tonight's program is presented by the Indy Dental Group. It's uh, Indy 500 veteran Dr. Jack Miller and his wife, Dr. Liz Lewis, have a spectacular practice. If you think you need your teeth checked, I highly recommend you go and see them. They have five offices in the area, so they'll find one that fits you. You call to make an appointment at number 317-846-6125. That's the Indy Dental Group. If you need insurance for anything, your vehicle, home, whatever, you go to uh, VP Insurance. They're located just a mile or so at 5004 West 16th Street, so about a mile west of the Speedway. Talk to Mike Pardee or Tom, the number is 317-248-0070. That's VP Insurance and Speedway. And if you like Trans Am, you like vintage Indy cars, you like any kind of race car, SVRA's got it all. So go to their website, uh, svra.com, and check out the schedule. If there's an event within an hour drive, I highly recommend you go. It's a phenomenal event. They bring great cars, great racing, you'll have a good time. My first guest is a gentleman I've had on several times. He's had uh, many hats in the world of motorsports. He at one time was, uh, I think, a vice president of marketing for IndyCar. So you notice how the, uh, how the uh, sponsorships have uh, dropped off. It's because he's no longer there. <laughs> he is now the general manager and vice president of NASCAR, and, uh, NASCAR, NHRA, and the general manager at what is once again Indianapolis Raceway Park. Please welcome Mr. Casey Kohler. So, uh, what's new and exciting? Yeah, so I was, I was mentioning, this has been kind of a crazy week, so we're starting to go into the throws. People always ask, you know, what do you guys do? You know, you probably just get ready for the U.S. Nationals out there. You know, we, we've done probably about 85 days of activity this year so far. Um, and we've got about another 60 to 70 days on the books for the remainder of the season. And then, you know, we pick up, I got a Silver Crown team that wants to test next week. So you get those things that just kind of come and you got to figure it out. But right now we're kind of in the throes of getting ready for our NASCAR event, uh, August 11th with the truck series and the, the Arkham Menard series coming back. So. As I was mentioning to you privately, they, they were there yesterday doing a site visit. They come in once a, once a year to kind of make sure safety-wise and everything's where it needs to be. Some of the improvements that we've, they've asked for, that we've made those improvements. And uh, the good news is, you know, we're, we're on schedule. We're doing what we need to. Now we're getting ready to put down all new fresh paint everywhere and make the place pretty for uh, August 11th. Now, I understand that... Uh... NASCAR has made a request which is rather irritating to me because I'm thinking, gee, wouldn't it be nice if they redid the, the road course? <laughs> but unfortunately, they want safer barriers, which will preclude the road course for some years. Yeah, I, well, it, at least, yeah, so the, the, the request has been, as they continue to look at, and I can't recall, was it Atlanta maybe where, where Ryan Blaney had that, that tough accident this year? And, hit the wall on the inside. So I think they're, they're looking at tracks and making sure that, you know, that there's more safer barrier around, especially on the inside um, and even on the outside of the driver's right-hand side. So that, that is something for the future that we'll, we'll take a look at. Uh, you know, it, it, a lot of it comes down to dollars and cents. That's a pretty big investment that we would have to make. As I mentioned to you, we're a drag racing organization. So, you know, we certainly, love and appreciate everything that that happens at the oval i i you know that's that's kind of one of my true loves but at the end of the day we've got the u.s nationals we've got a lot of drag racing that we need to continue to grow and protect and you know that takes a lot of resources as well uh, that's right the, the world's largest drag race is right here in town at what is now again irp yeah so we we decided to bring it back one more year no this is <laughs> Uh, this will be the 69th year. We're going in our 70th year next year for the U.S. Nationals. Um, it's that is a marathon. So you think about it. Our our participants, anybody that drives by there, you guys are you're, you know folks that are, are around here. You know that when you when you get close to our facility, even two weeks out, people start parking their trailers on the outside of the fences and. You know they fly back home and they're you know they're back in California and their rigs are sitting out there and we're trying to mow around them and do all those fun things. 
Um, but it is a marathon of an event because they move in on Sunday and we don't start on track until Wednesday. So we basically build a community of about a thousand racers, which typically with three people in there, you've got 3,000 people on the grounds. And so you're running basically a city for three days. You've got trash service, you've got you know, all of our, 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 our water service, everything that has to go on on top of uh, just trying to put on a race. And then, oh, by the way, then we get to Wednesday, and then, you know, when you typically go, boy, by the time you get to Friday, it's kind of downhill. But with this event, we, we still race on Monday. So even when you get to Saturday, you think you're, you're kind of, you're almost there, and you still have two more days. So it is, for our staff, you know, we really staff up. We have a really good staff that's done a great job of knowing all their marks about preparing for that event. Um, but it, 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 we're, we're already in the throes of preparation for the U.S. Nationals. Now, before that gets there, there is other events that take place. You use the Oval quite frequently, and you've got some interesting midget events upcoming. We do. So the, the neat thing this year, uh, the day following uh, our NASCAR and ARCA race on the, uh, the 12th of August, Saturday night, we've brought back the Twin 25. So, you know, those of you that are familiar with Steve Lewis when he did the Twin 25s, right? Uh, so it's two midget races. Uh, you win the first one. There's a guy back there in the left-hand uh, left corner that will be coming up here talking next and probably will be interested in the purse that's uh, attached to it. But, um, you know, you win the first one, you start in the back, and you go for 50,000 if you can, you, you can pass everybody on those next 25 laps. So it should be a lot of fun. But the neat thing on top of that that we've added to it um, we, we've packed a lot in on that night, but we're also doing something. We're working with the folks out at NEMA, which is kind of the Northeastern Midget Association, uh, with their lights category, no wings, and then the Ford Focus, or I used to call it the Focus side, the Focus Midgets for uh, USAC. They've combined on a rules package, and so we'll be having not only the National Midgets participating, but also uh, a, a separate race for the Focus and the NEMA midgets which is really exciting first time that we've had them on on track and then in addition if that's not enough we also have quarter midgets we've got the nascar usac quarter midget event going on with probably 200 to 300 participants going on and then oh by the way we also have super late models that we're running which i think we've got a couple of the nascar guys coming over to run that so you know we try to we pack as much in the box as we possibly can for somebody Super modified. Does Jimmy Owens run those no, anymore? Not super modified. Super super late models. Super late. Yeah, yeah. Super modifieds make me a little nervous on our track. <laughs> All right. Super late models. Did Jimmy Owens run that? One? I he, think he, he has. Yeah, I think so. Yep. I'm reading the book that Dave Argerberg. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, it, it's a very. If you haven't got it, you got to read it. It's really a good story. Um, you have an event that, you know, it's almost a joke to have it. You run the Silver Crowns. And there's no money on who wins because that's a, almost a given. I mean, this guy has, <laughs> has just torn everybody apart. But well, I, I my accounting department usually goes, "Hey, for our payroll each week, they go, we didn't see Swanson on there. Is he still working for you guys?" I say, "Well, he couldn't mow the grass this week." So, but in a couple of weeks, I'm sure we'll be making out a check, and you know, he'll, he'll everybody will everything will be right with the world. Um, what? Is, do you have a big now? Let's back track a little bit. Yep. Back w when uh, NASCAR came into town, uh, the, the Bush Series, that now the Infinity Series, used to run out there, and they had yep. to bring in more grandstands because the place was packed. Yep. Then they moved them out because NASCAR wasn't doing a bang up job, and it seemed to me, having been out there and looked around, and I could count the people, they they, they didn't do well. Is there any chance that they will come back? I know the trucks are not there. Any chance that they could bring the, the uh, Infinity Series? Yeah, so who knows, you know? I, I mean, especially as we see, you know, we went back to, you know, NASCAR went back to North Wilkesboro. There's, you know, the goal of trying to get them back to Nashville, potentially in a couple of years uh, at the fairgrounds. So you never say never, right? What's what's old is new again. Um, we would certainly love to, to have the Xfinity Series back. It's something that we've talked to from a high level about what that would take from an infrastructure. What does that take from a safety perspective? There's some things, you know, we, we pack a lot in with just the ARCA, uh, ARCA series as well as the truck series in one night. What does that mean for pit stalls and all those sorts of things? Um, so 
it, it's something that I think is, is on radars. Who knows if that's short term, long term. Um, but, you know, we, as I always tell our team, we, we just keep putting one foot in front of the other and, you know, what, whatever works out will work out. Well, since they have brought up that they would sure love to have you put Saferberg, why don't you bring the Infinity Series? That would help us get to that point. Uh, that, I think that's part of the discussion, right? We need, okay. we need things that can help uh, grow the, the event financially to be able to support, you know, additional safer barriers. Uh, one time you were the overseer at Atlanta. Now, I yep. understand many things have changed, yep. none the least of which being they're moving out of California, which is probably the smartest thing they've done. And you're going to have a lot of them over here in, uh, in Claremont. Yeah, so, so Atlanta Dragway shut down just a couple of years ago. That was a property in Commerce, Georgia that uh, we've had for, for quite some time. And it, and it was tough. We, there was a lot of sprawl in that area. If anybody that was ever to go by there, there was a, a billion dollar battery factory that, that popped up. And the next thing you know, apartments are growing across the street and it really became kind of difficult to be able to maintain a drag strip in that, that, that area, which is something that we continue to challenge. I mean, we're challenged with that almost on a weekly basis right now. We unfortunately are, are tracking in Denver, Colorado, Bandemir, uh, dragway this will be their final year uh, as well as you know there's been talk at Phoenix too which is you know we build these facilities what we think is out in the country at some point <laughs> and then the the city comes and finds us and then all of a sudden you've got traffic and you've got noise and you've got all these things that people didn't sign up for when they they built their houses so it is a balancing act we lost Atlanta, but one of the things when we sold that facility, it did not stay as a drag strip, you know, was to take that and reinvest it in the NHRA, reinvest it in our sport, reinvest it in our facilities. We sold our building out in California for our headquarters uh, right before the pandemic. That's another piece that we're going to continue to reinvest in our sport, reinvest in IRP. So, you know, I think what you'll see from us probably over the next three to four months will be an overall kind of uh, multi-year vision of what the property looks like. It's no secret, and I think when I was here, you know, earlier this year, we talked about the town of Brownsburg built a beautiful boulevard that's in an entrance into what currently sits as gate six today off of the Ronald Reagan. That will become our front door. That will be the new entrance into the facility long term. Uh, but in order to do that, there's a lot of things that have to move around. We have a ditch that runs right through our property, right underneath the drag strip. Not many people know that. So we're looking at what we can do to move that uh, and, and still make sure that we can, we can kind of check all the boxes from an environmental perspective. So long story short, we're going to be reinvesting in IRP. Probably more to come over the next couple of months, hopefully right around the U.S. Nationals, that we have a kind of a longer-term vision of what that looks like for a facility. Now, a couple of years ago, Lucas Oil took over the title sponsorship of the facility, and they changed it to Lucas Oil Raceway yeah. and took away IRP, which people didn't, they ignored that. Because when anybody that I've talked to say, what's going on in IRP? And with Brandon Bernstein now in that chair to make those decisions, that didn't seem to be a very difficult decision for him to make. No, Brandon was, in fact, we sat down, it was at Atlanta Dragway, and we talked about the renewal and said, you know, where do they see, you know, the, their investment in the, the track going? Are they happy? Or we're, we're continuing to grow. We're adding new events, bigger events. And they were. And, you know, one of the things that we kind of laid out was we, we really wanted to see the the return of IRP in some way, shape, or form, and he's like, I, I couldn't agree more. And so, honestly, you'd think that it might have been one of those, you know, really tough discussions or negotiations, and it wasn't. It was settled in about two seconds. We worked on, <laughs> we worked on mock-ups of what that looked like. We rolled it out right before PRI two years ago, and here we are. And people are thrilled because now they can say IRP and they know it. It's still <laughs> That's there. Right. And it's amazing how a name like that is stuck and it's carried for all these years and, and it, it just it's there um what what do you see going forward now that you said that, that the nhra has had to sell or has sold a few facilities are they going to build new ones are there new ones to take it up are they going to run at certain tracks twice to make up the number of events a year yeah. so so Part of that also is what is the right number of events? You know, up to 2018, 2019, we were running 24 national events. 
anybody that's related to somebody that works on one of these teams that are based right over here on Northfield Drive, they know that they're those folks are on the road quite a bit, right? We're not, it's not NASCAR where you get to fly the crew in, you know, the day of and they fly them back out. These teams are they're on the road just like the semi is. So, so for us, it's what's the right number of events, you know, and then also figuring out what are the right places to go. I don't know that we're in a position that we want to start going to the same place multiple times. I mean, there was talk at one point of, do we go back to Indy potentially at, at another point in time? I think we all want to be mindful and respectful of the, you know, the U.S. Nationals and make sure that we don't, don't hinder that. Um, we do have other tracks that are out there that, you know, I don't think it's going to take us from an investment that we have to buy it, but are there things that we can do to help facilities get to the level? A lot of it comes down to safety, right? There's you know, places that might not have the full concrete walls, the walls that are tall enough in the shutdown areas. Those are the things more so than, you know, grandstands and, you know, restrooms. We, we get to those. We can figure out a lot of temporary solutions. One thing that we did do this year, which kind of answers to a certain degree, is we, we took the risk and rented Route 66 up in Chicago, right, from NASCAR. Uh, beautiful facility, right? It, it, it's a shame that facility has sat dormant really since 2019. Um, and so our team came in, cleaned the whole place up. Our GM from Gainesville came up and spent a couple of weeks up there. Our team from Indy went up there uh, and we put on a a great event. weren't really sure what it was going to look like going into race week, uh, but the folks from the Chicagoland area, you could tell they, they really missed they missed drag racing, they missed motorsports, and uh, we get to go back there next year, which we're excited about. What are, besides the midget races and uh, NASCAR coming in town and the U.S. Nationals, which people don't realize that's the biggest drag race in the world. And there's it is. other events in Europe and so forth, but they don't compare anything close to, to uh, the U.S. Nationals. Um, what are some of the other big events besides those three that will take place at IRP? Yeah, so if you think about the remainder of our schedule, so we, we host, you know, we come right off of the U.S. Nationals and we host uh, the Division Three ET Finals for the NHRA. So that's roughly 15 to 18 drag strips throughout the Midwest that bring their all-star team of roughly 32, 35 participants. And whoever wins that gets to go to Las Vegas for our championship uh, event. So that's for our weekly competitors, our bracket racers. We do that right after the U.S. Nationals. Then we have the, the National Muscle Car Association, the NMCA. They have their world finals at the end of September. We have an event called Streetcar Takeover that was just here that's coming at the end of September as well. Um, and that brings a, a, a younger demographic of people that are just learning to run drag race uh, with streetcars. It's a, it's a unique event for us. And then we get into the Oval, you know, then we've got Championship Saturday, the second weekend of October, I believe it's the 11th of October this year, where we've got the Championship for Midgets, Silver Crown, and Sprint Cars. Um, so that's a, that's a big day, and then we've got a few more drag racing events to kind of round out the season. You've got an upcoming Silver Crown race. Do you make enough money going up to that in case Cody Swanson shows up? <laughs> You know, we were originally at three on the books this year. We were going to do the Hoosier 100 in April. We moved, and then that ended up getting rained out, and we moved it to May. So luckily, we only had to pay Cody twice this year with Championship Saturday and and Card Night on the Silver Crown side of things. So, but I do notice that you know on the Sprint Car side of things, he needs a little bit of help there. I noticed Berlin last weekend. Yeah, he, he didn't have the big check at the end of the day. So. Just not fast enough. <laughs> Here's a guy that I've, I've known since I've been here. Of course, when I got here, he wasn't born yet, or barely, <laughs> still in his diapers. But uh, uh, he, he drove one race in the uh, ladder program and won it. What the hell's he done since? Where is somebody going, we need Cody? Uh, well, I know. It's the... I think NHRA ought to sponsor I know, right? We had to we had Tony Stewart come over. Maybe Cody Swanson's the next one, right? <laughs> Get him behind a, the wheel of a top fuel car. How big a deal is it? Let's talk about Tony coming in. He, he buys a team or starts a team, marries his driver, which is pretty clever, <laughs> uh, and then he starts driving himself. What has that meant? Now, to me, when I go to a drag race, 
the big attraction is John Forrest, without question. If he leaves, they're going to say, now what? That's right. And, and if he does leave, I hope he cleans his driver's suit when he hangs it up. <laughs> but what has Tony meant to the series when he's there? Yeah, and I think we're finding out every day. We knew that it was going to be big. It was big last year just having the TSR banner at our events and Tony being around. Uh, and then, you know, it was kind of one of those kind of rumors you hear of, hey, he's going to go down. You know, we had a little bit of insight and knowledge because Frank Hawley's drag racing school happens to be based at our facility in Gainesville, so we knew he was taking, uh, running the alcohol car down there. But you, you kind of heard that it was just, he just wanted to see what it felt like, right? And then it was, okay, well, now he's going to go run a race out in Las Vegas with Rich McPhillips' team, and he did that. And then, you know, then it started to kind of, you could see the interest. And I, and I, I always tell people, this isn't one of those, and, and Tony has always been wired this way, right? He does, he's not the guy that just flies in the day of and, you know, he goes, signs some autographs, runs the race car, ends up in victory lane and flies out. You know, I, I'll, I'll remember this year, we're, here we are painting the starting line at, at Pomona. You know, we just switched over all the branding to In-N-Out. In-N-Out Burger took over the whole, the whole uh, branding of the, the facility. And, you know, we're, we're five days early, and here comes Tony, right? Just pulling up and just hanging out, really hanging out at a drag strip for five days before we're running race cars. And that's how it is everywhere he goes. You know, I know he's got a busy schedule with SRX. He had Kings Royal going on a couple weeks ago, but then there he is running a divisional race in Columbus, you know, on Saturday. So I, you, I, I didn't probably fully understand and appreciate, and I knew he was, a, you know, a racer's racer, but he truly enjoys it, I think. He, he puts the time and effort into it. He spends it with his team, right? It's not one of those that I'm going to go race this, but I want to go spend all my time with my top fuel team, right? That's where the glitz and you know, he's, he's back there with the alcohol guys helping pack parachutes, mix fuel, do all those sorts of things. So in what we're finding, even when we get to these events, people go, well, where's Tony's pit? Well, it's not part of the main pit area today as he runs in the alcohol category. You know, our dream is that he runs in the top fuel category, but you know, we'll, we'll see if that ever happens. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Nor would I. And his mother and his dad has told me, I said, how did he start? In a wagon with a Tupperware for a helmet in his driveway. Right. That started the whole thing. Look what he's done with it. The poor guy, I mean, nobody has to pass a hat for him. He's done very, very well. Smart right. investments. Smart things he's done. Yep. Of course, winning uh, the Brickyard a couple of times doesn't help in a championship. <laughs> a couple of, doesn't hurt of it either. So, um, what do you see for the future of drag racing? It, 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 at some point in time, and they're going to carry John Force out, kicking and screaming, <laughs> but they're going to take him up. Who is there to replace him? So, when we look at the. It, Nobody replaces John Force. I think that's first and foremost, right? Like he was, he, you, you, between him, Big Daddy Don Garlitz, Don Perdome, you know, Bob Glidden, there's kind of the Mount Rushmore. And, and then there's probably the second tier, and I think everybody admits, right? You, you've got Ron Caps, you've got Antron. We've got some really great ambassadors for the sport. We've got people that have a very, very passionate fan base. They're probably not to the level of John. They may never will be. Um, but... We've, we've got a kind of a cast of characters that make up, and they're passionate about the sport. They care a lot about it. So, you know, with all of those folks continuing to do what they do, they have the passion, the drive to continue to do this. It, the nice thing is our drivers, typically when they're in, they're racing, and they're with us year in, year out. There's some consistency. It's not one year in, one year out. Um, that's how we continue to build it. But we also, we have a lot of, we have a lot of young drivers coming through the ranks, probably more so in the A-Fuel dragster side of things that will end up going into top fuel. But what is what is the future of drag racing? It's a, it's a question that we spend a lot of time on because I don't know that drag racing may look like it does today in 10 years. We Our events probably look a little bit different. We're used to, and I talk about the marathon, I don't know that our facilities and our events can withstand five, six straight days of racing, three days of race. I mean, that's a lot of racing and a lot of wear and tear. Our windows, if you've been to an NHRA event, one of the best things is you can be there all day. One of the worst things is you can be there all day, right? Um, and so as we think about how do we shorten 
shorten the days a little bit? What do people come to see? And then what is the next category of, of categories that we have? We have a, a new category that's coming out called Factory X that will be out in a couple of weeks. This will, people always say, already say it's the, the future of pro stock, but these are, these cars look like what you see out in the parking lot right now. They're gonna go 200 miles an hour. They're really tough to drive. You have to shift them. Uh, it puts it back into the driver's hands. So I, I'm excited to see where that takes us. And then there's street cars, right? There's, I think we, we haven't played enough on the street car side of things. That's where the youth are. That's where we need to be. We want to do it in a safe environment. I, my PSA for the day is people don't realize the NHRA, we're not owned by anybody. We don't have an owner out there. We're, we're a not-for-profit. You know, we were started with the, the purpose of getting people off the street from street racing. That's still our mission. We have 120 racetracks that will have that, that mission as well. Um, so that's that's where I see you know our place in, in the sport. Well, fortunately, <clears throat> Antron Brown is fairly young. <laughs> and he, I, I'm a friend of his on Facebook, and he puts out more stuff than anybody. And there isn't a better guy, I don't think. I mean, people, once they hear him, once they meet him, and he's thrilled to meet you. I mean, unless he's putting his hat on. <coughs> but if he's in the pit area, in their, their area, He'll come out and talk to you, shake your hand, pose for pictures, he'll do anything you want. He's just a super, super guy. And to think he came from two wheels to be a world champion, multi-time world champion in four. So one of the things we, in April, we went, so there, basically all the sanctioning bodies, NASCAR, IndyCar, USAC, uh, IMSA, you know, we do one time every two years, we go to Washington, D.C., we take the leadership of each of the organizations and we take a couple of drivers. And it's, it's really to make sure that, that motorsports has a voice in, in, in D.C., right? There's, there's always talk about regulations that are potentially coming down. How does, you know, let's make sure that street cars aren't altered so they become race cars, all those things that we also want to push back against. But then it's also making sure that there's regulations that racetracks can stay racetracks throughout the country. So we all take various drivers from our, our, our groups. We took uh, Ron Caps and Antron this year, and it was myself and, and those two. And we, we spent the whole day meeting with constituents from each of the places where NHRA has national events. And, Antron, and, and Richard Petty was there, and they had a couple, you know, Ross Chastain, they had a couple of drivers from the NASCAR side of it. Travis Pastrana was there, and Antron, lights up the room right i mean he, he you, you push play and he goes and he not he's genuine too right he, he cares about people loves people but the people in the cafeteria at at uh, you know basically in, in congress were sitting there taking pictures of antron in the cafeteria because one his personality and two they knew who he was and it, it really opened my eyes uh, you know, we, we knew we have a, a great ambassador, but you know, it's probably not even as big as we, we, we think it is. Well, I think it's going to be bigger than you might be surprised. I think <clears throat> when John fades into the sunset, I guess they have sunset still in California, <laughs> um, and I have a feeling he'll be one of the guys, and Ron Caps as well, super guy. It, it, interesting, uh, Leah is with a different team, Don Schumacher lost her. Ron Caps left, he's got his own team. Antron left, he's got his own team. So Don Schumacher owns a building. Yeah, he's, he a, he's, he's, he's probably one of the smarter businessmen, right? <laughs> I mean, he's the one that's getting the getting the keep checks and cash them versus uh, spending the money. And he's got a pretty good uh, automotive business that's being built over there, too. Yeah, and I understand that in another year or so, some of the teams that are there will move on yes. and he'll fill it up with manufacturing. Yep. So, poor guy, you know, I, I used to feel sorry for him, but I don't anymore. He's on his boat today somewhere fishing, so. Oh, poor, poor <laughs> kid. Um, you know, I, I, I'm surprised uh, his son Tony Schumacher is back racing, mm -hmm. but I don't hear that much. I would have think, what, a seven-time champion, and he's back racing, and I don't read or hear that much about it, which surprises me, because Tony's a hell of a driver. He, he is. I, I think part of it is also... You know, performance hasn't been that that strong this year um, for that team. So once you start winning again, I think you, you you start hearing your name called. But for the past couple of years, it's been Steve Torrance, Brittany Force, right? Those are the two names that you hear a lot of. And then you've got Antron, and you've got some of those <coughs> folks that pop in and around Leah Pruitt. Um, but Tony, yeah, I mean, he it, it's great to have him back. 
he still has a lot of fans that still come see him at the race, but he's not somebody that, that we probably talk about as much as what we used to. Uh, I, I noticed that the, I think it was in Colorado last week, Brittany did all right for herself yeah. in her first round, 338 <laughs> miles an hour. I think Kenny Bernstein's got to say, you got to be kidding. When he broke the 300, it was a big deal. Now, if you go 300, you don't make the show. Right. So, in that, top fuel. well, and you talk about the future of drag racing. When, when is too fast too fast, right? Uh, our drag strips aren't getting any longer. You, these cars are still, they're, they're going faster, and the, and the shutdown area is still as short as it, as it can be in Pomona, California. There's places like Gainesville where, you know, if we had to run quarter mile, we could, and we could shut the cars down, and they could slow down and, and be in a safe. But there's a lot of places that, Real estate has compacted these racetracks, and, and what do you do to shut the it, it shut down the cars? But also, from going you know in 3.5 or 3.6 seconds in a thousand feet, physically, what can your body handle to be able to to continue to do that? So, and the tires, right, and everything else, the components that go with it. So I think that's something that we're very mindful of: is how fast is too fast. We're, we're not looking to put a speed limit on it. That's the last thing. But how do we make sure that we, we attempt to keep within safety, uh, both within the cockpit uh, and the car, but also the actual physical racetrack? Yeah, it's, it's, it's something to see. Uh, and I can remember when Kenny broke the 300 mile mark and they said, wow, you know, wow, this, how could this possibly happen? Well, as I said, you go 300 today in a top view and you need to make sure. Yeah. Um, and, but the cars seem to be relatively safe. I don't know if they're quite as safe as maybe an Indy car where you're wrapped in and buckled in and all that. I mean, they got seat belts, obviously. <clears throat> but to run a, 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 a car with the engine in front of you, that's another story. And those aren't reliable. I, when I say reliable, they're, they're much more reliable than they were a few years ago. But there's still... I mean, this past weekend, there's a few that, that blew up right in front of you, and, and there's a lot of containment that goes on, but that's still a pretty big concussion that, that happens but, right there. Well, I don't know. I think, uh, do, do you miss being involved in IndyCar at all? I mean, do you think about when you were there? Because I remember, I've still got your phone number yeah. for your office. Yeah. You don't answer my yeah. <laughs> 492 number. I haven't figured yeah. out why yet, but... Uh, I, I, I do. I, I, I love open wheel racing. You know, I, 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 there are a lot of pieces of it. I'm, I'm still a fan, which is neat. And that's fun to, to be able to, I, I get to, I feel like I get to contribute to open wheel racing just on a much smaller scale, you know, with what we do at the Oval. I, I would put the talent of Cody and some of the other drivers that compete at our track up there with anybody else in open wheel racing, you know. Um, I, Unfortunately, and this is the way of most motorsports, right? It is financials become really important, and therefore there are people that are able to afford positions in racing, maybe based off of either connections or financial dollars. And, we, and we've seen that for the past 15 years. Um, but I, I, I truly believe the, the quality and the, the talent that we have in the Silver Crown Series, the sprint car side of things, the midget side of things, uh, both not only from the driver but the, the crews and also the ownership you know that there's there's a lot of quality people there that you know have chosen to spend their time and their money and their efforts racing at our track which I, I take a lot of pride in and you should and it's it's neat where did you find 50 grand to start last in the second midget race and win it to 50,000 we uh, we've been looking through a lot of parking lots, picking up a lot of loose change. We go and put it on red every night over at the casino, and you know, hopefully we no, no we're we're fortunate. We've got some really good partners that help make this uh, make this work for us. Well, you know, if you read the book uh, on Jimmy Owens and, and how he started out just thinking he wanted to be a race driver, and then he became professional and got to travel and so forth, and some of the prize money that he made over the years. In the races, he's won in the three-time, I think a three-time Lucas Oil uh, dirt, dirt champion, yep. and he finished second the fourth year. He missed out. Um, but but you read how these guys what go through to become a professional race driver. You think you drive on weekends? No, professionals work on the cars during the weekend, and they drive on the weekends. It, it's it's very interesting 
what it takes. And when I first came here in 1963, I thought the car just rolled off the track and went out to the pit area and off they went. Boy, did I find out when I was there at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. That's not exactly, I mean, not that I worked on it, because yeah. I picked up all the stuff they threw off it. But uh, there's a there's an awful lot of work involved in driving a race car and building and having a championship caliber race car. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Yep. And it doesn't matter if you're running three and a half seconds. You know, something that interests me, <clears throat> when they cut it from a quarter mile to a thousand feet, they said, I'll save a lot of parts on our cars. Oh, really? I see a lot of cars going boom in a thousand feet. Well, the, the way that drag racing is built is, you know, the, the driver is critically important, but almost probably as critically important, or maybe even some people would say more important, is the crew chief. And those crew chiefs, that's a, that's a cutthroat business there, right? And, and they're doing everything they possibly can to get the, the performance out of those. So they're always pushing the limits. So even though there was probably a small period of time where they were able to kind of not put as much wear and tear or pressure on those parts when they, they went down to 1,000 feet, we're, we're back to packing everything we possibly can into just a, a shorter amount of time. Yeah, and you see when you guys roll up, the two crew chiefs are up making the adjustment, they're going the other way, you're ready. <laughs> you don't know what they're doing, but uh, it, I think it's very interesting. I think in particular in IndyCar and also in HRA, from what I know, you hear a lot, and I've said this the other day again, um, a lot of professional sports you hear about some of the characters that are in it and some of the things they do, but you don't hear that in top in, in the top of the line of motorsports. They can't afford it because there's a guy sitting there who's been resting all day waiting to get in the car, and his life depends on you doing your job, right? Not coming in with a hangover. Yep. And so I, I find that very interesting, and I think uh, you know the things that have been developed through motorsports uh, that are on the road. It's amazing. And it's fun to watch. It is. And if you haven't been out on a Friday or Saturday night at Nationals, that's the time to go. Because you see the fire, which you don't see during the day, but it's there. It's there. You just don't see it. Go on Friday and Saturday night, and you get to see the car burn. Wow. It, I, I, in, a, in a previous life, I worked in, bull, in professional bull riding. And I always said, you know, drag racing is very similar to, to uh, the PBR, whereas it's, a, it's an experience that you have to see it and feel it once. Uh, you know, you can, yes, you can go to the rodeo and you can see somebody ride a bull, but when you go to Madison Square Garden and you see, you know, the top of the top bulls and you realize, wow, this is something different. I always say that about drag racing too. You have to see it, feel it, experience it. TV doesn't do it justice. Don't say that, I watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for what you do. I've heard nothing but rave reviews on your performance and the people enjoy working with you because you're a guy and I've seen you actually. If you're riding along or walking along, you see something on the ground, you'll pick it up. You don't call somebody from the hump hump department and say, hey, there's a pop can here, come and get it. Uh, people enjoy working for you and with you and uh, without them, you'd be like me standing there talking to yourself. <laughs> so, it, it, it in order for us to do 170 days of activity, it takes it, it takes a full team effort. We've got 330 acres of, of grounds there. That's a lot to take care of. So everybody has a hand in that. And, and so uh, I appreciate you saying that, but it, we've got a really good team of people that, that, that go above and beyond where what their job responsibilities are to make this work. Well, you need to talk to some of the asphalt companies that drive by everyone. So you got the extra asphalt, they put it on the road course. Uh, <laughs> I, I need runoffs. I need some. Uh, I need catch fence. I need a few other things too. If, you, if I see those trucks dro driving by too, I'll stop them. <laughs> well, I thank you for your time. I, I thank you for what you do. And uh, what, what's your next event at, on the Oval? The next event on the Oval will be the NASCAR event and uh, Arc Menard Series, Friday, August 11th. You can go to raceirp.com. We have free parking, free camping. Uh, Tickets are only $35, so it's a, it's a great night of racing. Then you come back the next night, you watch Cody go for $50,000 if he can win that first midget race. Um, and we've got a, a great night of racing there, too. Spectacular place, and so much better to say, go out to see him run at IRP. Thank you, Don. Thanks Appreciate it. Appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thanks for being here. And I want to mention for those of you that can hear 
me, I want to thank uh, our, our sound is courtesy of Pierce Productions. He is becoming uh, world famous for his uh, work. I, I understand there's several theaters that are looking for him to perform, so hopefully he will move up. My next guest is over chewing the rag and trying to uh, make sure he gets a check made out in a proper name out at this track. <clears throat> in case you hadn't heard, uh, last Thursday was the uh, annual Rich Vogler Classic. And uh, they had a good number of cars, but it didn't make any difference. This guy ran away with it. He had the place covered. And he's done it all year. He's got more wins than anybody else, more championships than anybody else. The man, can he drive a silver crown? You betcha. Please welcome Mr. Cody Swanson. <laughs> now, you graduated from high school, summa cum laude. And one would think you would be the CEO of some big thing, some outfit. You drive race cars. What do your parents think about that move? <laughs> I, try, I try not to ask, I suppose. But um, I, um, you know, I had a great education, right? And, and graduated high school and, and graduated college um, with a degree in agriculture economics. And the economics part I promptly ignore just so I can keep racing, right? Um, well, and, I don't know. Uh, and, but, but it's been um, it's been a lot of fun. It, it um, has has afforded me the opportunities to, to see the world that I never would have otherwise. So uh, you said agriculture, and if I'm not mistaken, your brother Tanner, who gives you trouble when he comes to town, is in the agriculture business. I know he was here last year. I talked to him about it. And he said, "Boy, if we don't get right in California, we're in trouble. The country's in trouble because of the, the products that come out of there." But they got it, so he's probably happy this year. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, that, so I grew up in Central Valley, California, um, bordering on the two leading agriculture counties uh, in the country. And so it was a big part of, you know, our, our town, our community, um, part of our family livelihood. Uh, my dad operated a you know, small farm and a lot of custom tractor work for, for the dairies that are around. Um, so that was a, a natural fit and interest that, that I had, that my brother had, and, and he's made a career into it. Um, you're working for what's now Golden State Farm Credit. Um, like you mentioned, he still leaves work early and comes to IRP and takes all the money if we're not careful. So um, he, uh, he's got that part down. But um, no, it's, it's something that, that um, is a topic that, that I, I enjoyed. And, and like in, in school, I, I took a year of mechanical engineering, um, but I really felt like, um, you know, if I was going to college to kind of have a backup plan beyond racing or, or even still to, to learn things that, that, that I have applied in racing, um, there were a lot of great professors in, in that agriculture college that understood I was on the road and, and flying back and forth the Midwest to, to race while I was still going to school and um, fortunate to at least at least have that um, that foundation that, that I think helps me as I, as I try to make a career out of race car driving. What do you think you have that's different than another driver? Now there's a, there's a young lady coming along by the name of Kaylee Bryson. And uh, I guess she was hard. She got the hard charger award at the, at the Vogler Classic. She's come in. She's leading the uh, rookie of the year, I think, and uh, doing very well. She couldn't catch her uh, Thursday mm. night. But uh, what is it that's different between you and another driver? Say Justin Grant. What What's the difference between you two? I mean, every driver is good at different things, right? They have different strengths, different weaknesses. Um, I mean, I've seen it within my own family, right? Between yeah. Tanner and I, and we're both raised in the same house. We shared a room till till I moved out, right? And <laughs> and um, and somehow we still ended up having different strengths, uh, in, you know, in the race car. So um, I don't I don't know necessarily what exactly is different. I know I try awful hard. Um, and, and I put, put a lot of effort in, and that's something that would, I, I would tease and drive me nuts about my brother, is I feel like I'd have to figure out what I needed to do to go fast, and he'd hop in, and he'd go fast, and I'd ask him, well, what was that about? And he'd be like, I, I just went fast. Like, he, he could just cut right to the chase and, and not have to do all the wind up, and, and maybe I do more of that than I should, um, but, but in certain things, it it's maybe helps me in Silver Crown, uh, maybe it doesn't really help me when it's time to run a dirt sprint car uh, with three wheels in the air. Yeah, I understand that. Um, 
Will he be here for this midget event coming up? You would have to contend with him for he, that. Yeah, he, he should be. Um, and and the, the, you know, the midget thing has been awful tough the last few years um, to where uh, Jeff West, IPC, and Bobby Seymour, they've kind of got a three or four car team that, that they, they win with Bobby Santos or Jake Trainer or Chuck Gurney Jr. runs really fast. And there's so many um, good midgets that, uh, that it's, it's been really fun, really competitive. Kyle O'Gara's won uh, you know, each of the last couple of years. Um, so that, that's going to be a tall order to win either of those races, but um, you know, then you have my brother coming to town and, and he always runs good with the midgets, but he runs you know, even better when the Silver Crown cars are in town in October. So a um, bunch of good cars, you know, neat opportunity. It was great to hear you get a chance to talk with Casey and, and I, he, you know, he mentioned being on a, on a smaller scale at open wheel racing than his, maybe his role in IndyCar, but um, what he's done for us is, is he's made uh, made our events bigger scale, right? We've raced for more money with the Hoosier 100 this year than, than we ever did when it was on dirt, you know? And, and I loved it at the Indiana State Fairgrounds, and I wish it was still there. But, um, you know, what he's done for, for, for the Silver Crown Series and open wheel racing at IRP has, has made it bigger for us, and, and um, that's something that really goes a long way. You, you uh, studied economics, so you, you know when they say there's 50,000 from last to first, you understand that. I follow that, yep. Yeah, that makes sense to you. Yeah. And then your, your wife and family say, hurry, Dad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it seems to me that, that racing now, the national series, and some of the smaller ones, as, as Casey was saying, that are coming from the East Coast to run here. Um, the, the, Motorsports in general, open wheel in particular, are doing quite well. I mean, the car counts are certainly up uh, quite a bit. I know Silver Crowns, they d dusted a lot of cars off and have brought them out. And I think what, uh, Rich, at the Bogor Classic, there were 30 some cars, I think I saw. Uh, we had 26, 26 there, there right. at Winchester, which, which I mean, you're, you're right. I feel like the Silver Crown has has grown a lot and stabilized a lot over the last few years. And, and I look back, right, I mean, USAC has, Silver Crown's relatively new to Winchester, right? It's only our third race, but as far as USAC sprint cars, Winchester Speedway is still third all time on hosting the most USAC sprint car races, and they haven't run one in 10 years, right? Yeah. So so they ran there a whole awful lot. And um, even then, when I watch, you know, look back through the results, because I'm, I'm into the history of the sport too, um, when there was a lot of traveling cars that ran the whole schedule, um, you didn't have great big fields at Winchester for, for one reason or another. So I think it's been really encouraging to see that many Silver Crown cars excited to, to come to a place like that. We've, we've grown, we had, a, we had a big event, you know, there there during the week of Indy at, at IRP with, with a bunch of Silver Crown cars. Um, the dirt miles have continued to grow to where I feel like it's been, been really strong the last few years. And, and we talk about, um, you know, sprint cars kind of coming back on the pavement. The 500 Sprint Car Tour is relatively new, but it's but it's basically the, the folks from Anderson with the Little 500 have kind of started that as a touring series. Last year was the inaugural year, but but to try to help build a deeper field, not only for the Little 500, but to give guys who, who run pavement sprint cars a chance to get them out and, and, and race them more during the year, so that way we're all better when uh, when that big week comes in May for us. In Berlin, apparently there were some guys that had a little more experience than you. Um, they're just better than me at it oh, right now, Don. And it's and it's Tyler Rorig, and um, I got no shame in telling you this because I've been chasing him the last four races there now, <laughs> and um, I've tried a different setup every time. I still haven't figured it out. Um, but but something that uh, I mean, I, I you asked about what's maybe what's different me versus other drivers. And I and I try to be really realistic on where I'm at and, and what I need to do better. And he's he's doing a better job than me there. He's, uh, he's, he's raced there a lot, but he not only knows the racetrack better and how to drive it, but he knows what his car needs, and I'm trying to catch up to that. So um, I feel like uh, admitting you have a problem is the first step in getting closer to catching up, and so I'm hoping now that we've admitted it here on the show, maybe I can start catching up. How much time, did, uh, it, early on when I first met you, you had a job during the week. Mm -hmm. You still do that, or are you full time racing? Um, I <laughs> so we talk about economics and yeah, trying to make uh -huh, good decisions. Uh -huh. um, I went full time racing in the middle of COVID in oh, July good, of 2020, yeah, right on schedule, right? Um, but 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 as as weird of a time as that was, that was the same summer I got the opportunity to run on the road to Indy Ladder. Um, I got to make a start in the Arca Menard series. Um, that it, it just shook up enough different things and and the company that I work for Alton Woodsick Engineering still have a great relationship with them um, they were 
an essential business during all that. And we're, the guys in the office were hunkered down and, and doing their part to not be out and about. And here I was driving to Iowa, I was driving to North Carolina, I was flying here and there, and I was like, I was, I was a high liability maybe in, in terms of the way things uh, seemed at that point in time. And, and the, the reality became this, I, I, always had a, I had a great opportunity there and I had a great thing going, um, working there and racing Silver Crown cars and making a career out of that. But, but if I wanted more than that, which I did, I wanted, wanted to try to make it to Indianapolis or make it down south or make it somewhere to really, really make a career racing, um, I wasn't getting any younger. And so the opportunity was there to, to kind of go for it and double down, and, and, I, and we did, because we, my wife was supportive of it, and, um, and, and went for it. And, and it turned out that in the midst of that, in 2020 being a crazy year, uh, I'm all in on racing come 21, and it was, it was the best year I'd had yet. You know, so um, just kind of took took that leap of faith, and we're not talking about faith that, that you know we man, we believe that, that God's got a plan for us, and, and even though it may not be the one I designed, I sure am grateful that um, you know with opportunities He's blessed me with, and and so so for now I'm a, I'm a full time racer, I guess you, you mentioned that right? That you show up on the weekends because there's there's plenty to do and plenty going on, and and um, I work hard from home to to study and be prepared for my job. As a, purely as a driver, um, but tomorrow morning I'll be headed to the race shop to help uh, help the guys get get the car ready because we're racing in Nashville this weekend. I see. So it's it, it isn't the glamorous thing that people say. Oh, look, he's a race driver, he's a winner, and they think you just lou lounge around on a, a chaise lounge and have a a nice tea by your chair. You're busy every day. Yeah, it, it hasn't quite worked out that way for me anyway. Um, I don't know if other guys were able to order that on their bingo card, but I've missed it. Um, no, I mean, there's there's been, uh, there's more nights than I should admit that I stayed on air mattress on the shop floor this spring just because um, we were hustling hard to get cars done and things ready and, and trying to, trying to <coughs> our best foot forward to give us the best opportunity chance to win and so I feel like if, if I'm all in on on the racing then you got to be all in on what it what it takes to win and sometimes it's it's not the it's not the fun stuff it's the it's the the work in the middle of the night that, that no one's gonna see but um, you know if that's the difference that, that gives you a better chance to win um, I sure don't want to lose and wish I could have tried harder um. <clears throat> Do you understand the cars enough that you can help set them up because you know what you need to adjust to get the feel you want for the car? Um, certain kinds of cars I feel like I do. Uh, I feel like I get along pretty well with pavement silver crown cars um, just from having that experience and knowing you know, what, what they need at certain places and then being able to cross-reference. We've been to enough different tracks at this point in my career to, to try to know what's worked and what hasn't. Um, pavement sprint cars, I, I think I'm okay at, except for when we go to Berlin. <laughs> Apparently, I don't know that. Um, and then, you know, there's enough that, that I, I follow the concept well enough, but, but it's, still, it's still really important to have good people in your corner, right? So, um, you know, a lot of the success I had on, on dirt was racing Bob Hampshire and Clark Lamb. You know, everybody knows Bob is a Hall of Famer, National Sprint Car Hall of Fame, and, and so to rely on him for the dirt silver crown part, but he taught me a lot about about the, the pavement too, just on how things work. So that was a big turning point for me. Um, I, mean, I grew up racing uh, with a family team. And my dad ran everything from super modifieds to late models to modifieds. And he learned sprint cars to help my brother and I get going. And so he's someone I lean on a lot. And, and then you fast forward through some of the different teams and opportunities I've had. Um, met great people all along the way. You know, to, to now I'm racing with, with Kevin Doran and, and Dan Binks. And, and their race team, um, you know, on the on the pavement, sprint cars and, and Silver Crown, um, Tim Bertrand with the pavement midgets, and then uh, I got familiar friends helping on the dirt stuff again. I, the the dirt Silver Crown car runs out of Doran Binks Racing all under one roof, but uh, Bob Hampshire's been uh, helping me out over the phone a little bit, trying to trying to speed up our, our program, and um, and so I, I know I guess I know just enough to be dangerous and not enough to be good, but I'm thankful to have good friends and good people that that make it all come together. Uh. You know, it, it's, it's interesting how you get into this sport and it's almost like you can't let it go. And I had uh, Dr. Pat here two weeks ago mm -hmm. and I made the mistake of mentioning <clears throat> that you had one shot, one race with the uh, Road to Indy program. You were, I think, believe you were in a Pro 2000 mm -hmm. car and you won the race. Mm -hmm. And Pat says, I'm furious. He should have been in Indy car five years ago. You should have moved up. I mean, you have obvious ability. You have 
one of your big fans is sitting right over here. If you weren't here, she'd be home dusting and vacuuming, and he'd be supervising. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, did you ever get any offers, anything, or do they say, how much money have you got, let's go racing? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? Um, just the whole, the whole situation for the sport um, is different than it was historically, maybe. Um, you know, where, where there was, you know, if you think about the, the recession in 2008 or 9, if you, the NASCAR example is the, is the easiest one because they had so many layers of driver development that they were hiring 16, 17 year old kids to be part of their driver development program, bring them up through, right? So I know that was happening in other places, but that was the most obvious one. And as that changed, you know, the finances changed. Instead of, you know, these companies paying so much to be on a cup level car that these teams could afford to, to develop drivers and bring on the next layer, um, teams were, were struggling to, to make it all connect. And, and so like Casey mentioned, sometimes there's drivers that either um, connected the dots better on that end to, to help teams be able to make it to the racetrack. Um, and, that, and that became a whole nother layer versus just being able to go fast. And so um, if I had spent more time on the economic side and the sponsorship side, instead of the how to drive in circles fast part, um, maybe I could have figured it out different. Um, but, but so that's just kind of where the opportunities went. I, I met a lot of teams that, um, you know, that, that would have interest, but, but ultimately, um, if I'm not able to connect the right dots, then, then um, just going fast enough maybe isn't enough anymore. Right well, now. I think it's starting to change a little bit. I may remember back, in, I forget what year it was, uh, when Al Unser Jr. realized that for him at that time to drive, he had to help bring a sponsor. He said, I've never done that. I've never had to look for a sponsor. I got hired to drive a car. And uh, it, it was that way. And I think it's starting to change a little bit. Yeah, I think it really is. And so it, it kind of did in, in 2020, right? That was kind of the whole timing of it was um, there were more opportunities that were starting to pop up. And, and we have an example like Josh Berry, right? That, that was someone who happened to be in the right place at the right time and won on the right night. And um, I feel like I've, I've been really fortunate to win some races, but I've always ran second on the right night, apparently. <laughs> and um, I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to either find sponsorship or win the right races on the right time. And, and that's uh, something that I struggled with for a period of time. I was younger, but um, as uh, I mean, I, I came to a crossroads at one point to where um, I realized I wasn't enjoying what I was doing and that was not right because I was getting to do something <clears throat> that when I started racing I never dreamed I would get to do so there was so much to be incredibly grateful for to drive some of the coolest cars that still exist right and and that, that why why would I um, be anything but but excited about that and so in the you know in the time since that's that's how I really look at it um, the, the people I race for uh, I feel like Silver Crown is kind of frozen in time to where it is that last little niche of there are team owners so there, there's not as many as there used to be but some that'll hire you just because they want you to help their car go fast and try to win a race and so I'm that's all I, I dreamed of doing so I'm fortunate to, to get to play that role get to do that even if you know if it's if it's on this scale it's not in Indianapolis um, hey that's something that, that I understand I'm still working really hard uh, to try to, to try to get there someday but you know for now I, I want to be appreciative of the opportunities I, I do have and the fun stuff I do get to do um, the 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 staying up all night to <clears throat> work on the car may not be the most exciting thing, um, but the chance to, to win a race with people that, that you're excited about, that are excited with you to go for it, um, you know, that, that kind of makes it all worth it. Well, as you know, and I found out in 1964 when I came here and I started working for a team after I figured out how to sneak into the garage area and all that kind of hocus pocus, I went, bought a fire stone jacket and I stole a, a rag out of a guy's pocket and I walked through it. I put my hands and they let me in the garage area. <clears throat> and I got on a team and I thought, well, they just back the trailer up and take the car out, clean it up a little bit, go out and run. <laughs> what a joke that is. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, you spend hours and, and some of the first days that I worked for the team, we're there until two, three o'clock in the morning. I thought, oh, wait a minute. I thought they'd just roll the cars out and away they went. No, there's a lot of work, a lot of work in, in, any, in any series for that matter. But the, it takes a lot to make the car go. Do you still have in the back of your mind, do you think you're still young enough, and I'm sure you are young enough, to make a shot at the 500? Um, every, every time I think I'm too old, somehow another conversation comes up that I think, well, maybe not. Maybe one more year. <laughs> and, and, you know, there, 
like I said, uh, I thought I was too old before I got the opportunity in that pro car. And so, you know, made, made some of that. And, and while time has gone on, it didn't seem like it's done anything. There's conversations that happen now still that that, that gets brought back up. So, so I don't, it hasn't fixed anything all the way for me yet, but it keeps the conversation alive. Uh, well enough to, to say you never know. Maybe I'll last long enough for, for things to, to shift to where opportunities come up. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'm just going to keep racing as hard as I can to keep trying to win races so I, so I stay in that conversation. And um, But like you mentioned, right, it, it, it takes so much work, not only from the driver's side, right, because no matter if I'm there till midnight or not, it, it doesn't matter on just me alone. There are so many people that, that are a part of it that, that do a great job that cover so many of the bases on the team side. That um, that I can you know come as you know, the last guy in to to help you know I guess help kick the extra point or, or whatever to go the, the last extra mile to, to make sure we're the best we can be but all that all that foundation is is laid and all those all those key components are are, are handled by you know by the members of the team that, that all do a great job to give us a chance to to win together on race day. Well, it seems your crew is pretty good since you run a few of the Silver Crown races. You won several of their championships. I think more than anybody in history, and you're still going at it, and you're still winning, and yeah. you're still beating the hell out of everybody, pretty much. Um, I mean, obviously, your, your well, crew knows how to build a car. Yeah, they, they, they really do. They do a good job. And I mean, shoot, when you talk about the, the, the team I'm with now, right, Kevin Doran has won the Rolex 24-hour Daytona six or seven different times in mm -hmm. different roles, everything from crew chief to engineer to car owner to manufacturer, right? So. Um, not only that, you know, Dan Binks is, is our sprint car engine builder. He's had, you know, wild success in all forms of, of road racing and, and Le Mans. And so um, they come from, from a little bit of a different world and we're all kind of merging uh, for a love of, of the Silver Crown series, right? So, um, and, and the open wheel cars, I feel like they're frozen in time, right? I mean, they're, they're the modern version of, of what Indy was when it was roadsters. You know, they just have gone this, this path. We still got the engines in front. We still have way more horsepower than we need and not enough traction to do it all. So um, I, I mentioned them being fun to drive. I think that's what's so much fun to drive about our kind of cars. And, and it was neat. Talk about the pro opportunity. I got to run the Pro 2000 at, at IRP the same night we ran the Silver Crown cars. So I got to go back and forth and I talked about doing double duty and you know, other cars too, similar or different, and you cannot get two more different cars than a Pro 2000 and a Silver Crown car. They both go the same lap time, but even the racetrack looks different because your head is about three feet higher in a Silver Crown car versus sitting in the tub. I've, I've never not been able to see over the wall at IRP, and, and here I'm in this you know, bathtub <laughs> laid down, and it's like yeah, the whole thing even looks different. So, um, but, but I really in, I enjoy every opportunity to drive new cars, but it's just there's something about Silver Crown, Sprint Cars, Midgets that all have more horsepower than they do grip that uh, it makes it fun to try to, to, try to hang on. Well, you are aware. I, I, obviously, you enjoy running Winchester. I did not, usually, well, historically. Yeah. Yes. I've never liked running Winchester. Really? Um, when, well, I kind of did the other night. But I'll tell you, well, so, was, so, nice so, <laughs> so, so, Winchester, Salem, Gateway, Phoenix, those places, um, I tease that when you're on your way home, you think about all the fun you had. But in the moment, it's not that much fun. And I don't know if, I mean, for me, it's, I think it's because what's at stake, right? I mean, we, we go to, I mean, you, you think about the history of those places, the history of, of people that were lost at those places, and, and that weighs on you some. And so you go, it's really cool to go really fast, but at the same time, um, your body feels like I'm going faster than I should for how big this racetrack is, and and so there's there's some um, weight to that on how fast things happen, how fast things that could be out of your control, mistakes you could make, um, and so so I mean I, when we go to those places, I try to apologize to the team ahead of time. I'm going to be extra moody today. I'm going to be extra grumpy today. It's not your fault, but there's nothing I can do about it other than try to give you a heads up, and I'm sorry ahead of time. And um, and even even in Winchester, we had a great day. We had a great car, and and I'm still on edge because of the gravity. I think that places like that demand, you know, for for the respect, for the awareness. And so, um, on the way home, I, I thought about the fun that I had at Winchester. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's a number of uh, names I won't name who they are uh, that did were successful at Indianapolis and in IndyCar. They refuse to run Winchester. They said it scared the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. 
And that, that, that I, when I heard that, when I first started going out there, I said, you've got to be kidding. Yeah. When, so when I first came, I mean, I, I, I talk about, I, I appreciate the history and stuff. Um, I, when we go to Winchester, when I went to Memphis for the first time, when I go to these places, I watched the old footage that was Thursday Night Thunder, and I just listened to uh, Gary and Larry hosting Thursday Night Thunder at, at Winchester, and Larry Rice talking about after all the success he'd had, he never really liked Winchester, never really got along with it, never, you know, never became fond of it. And when I first moved to the Midwest, um, when I first came back here to race, someone took me to Winchester, and the most banking I'd ever seen before that in my whole life was 12 degrees. <laughs> you talk about being a, yeah, a whole a whole another ball game. And so um, it was a place that I was really intimidated by. Winchester, I took a midget to Salem. I, I, I tested a midget at Salem, and I must have been white as a ghost when I came in because they said, hey, you got to remember to breathe. And I didn't think I had forgotten until I took a breath. I'm like, well, oh, it's been five laps since I did that. And so um, I still, so I, ne so I didn't like it. We didn't get to run there very often. And, and talk about the resurgence of the Silver Crown Series. So if I wind that into this, Andy Hillenberg was a big part of getting oh, yeah. the thing back going, 2014, 15, 16. Yep. And in 2016, um, the GM at Salem, hey, we need another pavement event, and they brought the Silver Crown Series on. And I was not real thrilled about it, about having to go back to Salem. Um, but we were in a tight points battle, and it was time to put, you know, pull your boots on and, uh, and, and do your job for your team. And I was so happy we ended up winning that day because all I wanted, now I had Salem checked off my list, and I hoped we never went back. <laughs> and at least had a win. And, um, and we're in the parking lot, and Andy says, it was pretty good today. Don't you think we should come back? And I'm like, no, man, come on. <laughs> so anyway, we went back. And um, Andy didn't listen, but, but we went back, and at that point it was, okay, if they're gonna, if they're gonna make me do this, I'm gonna have to learn to love it, right? There's, I went to Syracuse, nobody likes Syracuse, but I thought if I can learn to love it, more than them, I'll get better at it. And so I, I wanted to build that tolerance to learn to love Salem, and, and I, I learned to do that. And, and Winchester has kind of been the next track on that progression of, um, we're gonna have to do it anyway. Um, somebody's gonna win, so I might as well suck it up and figure out uh, how it can be us. And the best way I can think of was get ahead of everybody so you don't get tangled up in anybody else's problems. <laughs> it, uh, starting up front is, uh, is much easier than having to, having to race your way through. But, um, I mean, I, I talk about the, the history of it. I, I learned something about Winchester. We tell you this, this comes full circle even with Casey Kohler. A couple years ago, they had the A.J. Foyt Championship and they had a dinner afterward. And I got to sit down with uh, Tom Bigelow. Uh, Mac McClellan, uh, Johnny Parsons, they were all former champions of, of what, you know, retroactively became the AJ Foyt Championship. And we got to tell them stories and they were talking about Winchester and, uh, and, and what Winchester was like in that era. And I'm so thankful I get to do it in this era and not that era, <laughs> uh, for sure. <clears throat> but anyway, there was things that, that even just having that conversation that, that you know, clicked on a light for me a little bit about Winchester, about those types of places, just the perspective that they had. I mean, at that time, they raced so many different things and so many different racetracks that, that I haven't had the experience of. So um, I try to pay attention to all the little things and, and hopefully uh, I can learn from it. Well, those guys, especially Tom Bigelow, I can remember going to racetracks and passing, I see a guy pulling a, a sprint car on an tra open trailer and try, drive by and get upside at Tom Bigelow. Mm -hmm. Jeez, Louise, all these races you won, one, probably one of the best drivers ever in open wheel racing. Here he is dragging up a trailer. That wasn't that many years ago, but he's still active, he's still interested, he still follows the series. Yeah, and, he, he was at Winchester the yeah, other night, yeah. been signing autographs, yeah. and uh, always always appreciate to see him, you know, whether it's at, at racing events in the community or at the racetrack. Um, and it's, we've been fortunate to, I've been fortunate to be back here long enough to meet a lot of great uh, characters and people that have been part of uh, so much of our racing history. And I think you summed it up, characters. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, uh, that's, what makes, that's what makes it fun, right? Um, all of us have a little bit of that in us, and it's, it's fun because racing is such a unique sport. I think, it, I think it brings it out. Well, you seem to be working your way up the ladder, and I hope at some point in time before I get out of here um, that you will make an appearance in the, in the next series and then make a uh, move up at least get to run the 500 once. Jack, Jack Hewitt did it. Yeah, and he doesn't even like pavement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, uh, I, shoot, that's another, you know, obviously historic in, in the Silver Crown series and spring cars all over, right? And he, he, 
Uh, I, I know he cherished the opportunity to run at the 500, and so um, I, we're still still working towards it. I don't know if that'll be in the cards for me or not, but um, I, I appreciate the people that people like you that, that have mentioned that and offered that sentiment. That means a lot to me, um, and and people that have, have tried to pitch in along the way to you know whether it's connecting the dots with with a phone call or a, or a business card to, to to know who I need to try to contact next. Um, it's been been uh, man, it's been great to have the support of the racing community. And uh, and it'd be sure would be neat if one day it all worked out. Listen, I think if you say something right, you might get a hundred bucks from the lady. All right. Okay. That's a step forward. Yeah. There we go. Uh, her, her honey pie might not be happy, but she doesn't care. <laughs> so you know, it's interesting. I've never, ever, ever, ever heard a bad word about you at any time. You got on your car, you didn't win. You didn't, you know brush people off you're always willing to stop and say hello and sign an autograph post for a picture fortunately she got a couple okay. uh, and he managed he couldn't get down on the track to get the picture of you at uh, the Vogler Classic you get them but you could get it mm -hmm. yeah there you go. the lady smiles and he says come on yeah <laughs> I want to thank you for your time uh, we wish you nothing but the best and, uh, I'm sure you will continue to do and uh, be looking very closely when Tanner gets into town. How yeah. you handle it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the worst part is he'll come take all the money, and then yeah. he'll, he'll come home, and then want to have dinner together afterward, and, <laughs> and tell me all about it. Now, I, uh, I I love that, right? It's it's so um, neat to have my family come into town. You know, when Tanner races, and and his wife and children, and my parents and grandparents and stuff like that. It's uh, a lot of neat memories made, uh, even if it is uh, about him uh, spanking us for the night. <laughs> I have a feeling he's going to have to work a little bit harder this year because, you know, they're showing up two days or so before the race to do a little warm-up. Uh, you've been working. Uh, the, 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 the best and worst part about that is somehow he does it. Yeah, I know. I mean, they would, they were, they would be talking, you know, guys, oh, they've been out of the seat for a while, I haven't driven these kind of cars, and he would, he would come off of nine months of banking and be quick time in five laps in hot laps and it's like come on dude you know um but um he, if he's if he's gonna i don't know if he's gonna beat all of us anyway at least he's my brother at least i love him and uh, i can i can uh, find a silver lining in that right i guess <laughs> i'm gonna have to it's not my choice yeah, that's right <laughs> yeah well you have a, a degree in economics so i think uh Put your head to the grass. I got somebody you need to talk to. I'm going to put you in touch with them. Okay. That might be able to help you. Um, it's good to see you. I wish you nothing but the best. And then, of course, I think there'll be a number of people that'll be sitting in the grandstand to see if you could win the first midget race and go for fifty thousand in the second. Yeah, I sure would. Sure would love a chance. It's great to see everyone in the grandstands and see them after the races. Appreciate you uh, reaching out to have me come out and hang out with you. I always enjoy that. And great to see everybody here tonight. And uh, thanks for letting us come out and talk a little bit about racing. One last question. If yep. you were to get to, to advance to the Indy cars, would your wife would be happy with you driving 230 miles an hour instead of 130? Well, um, we've talked about that. I'm sure right? you have. And um, I mean, at that, at, that, at that point, right, That that's kind of what we've been building the career towards. And, and I don't know that at IndyCar, currently talk about the updates and safety, they're going 230 at the Speedway. We're going 180, and the Silver Crown car is a gateway. Um, with um, anyway, with with the Silver Crown cars, right? So, um, so I, I mean, obviously it's different. Going 230 miles an hour would be an experience uh, like none other for me at that point in time. But um, it would it would would be something I think that that we'd be welcome to to give it a shot. Well, I hope you get the shot. I'm not getting any younger. I'd love to see it. So. <laughs> yeah, I I, I'm going to put you in. I'm going to put a guy in, in touch with you about that. Okay. Um, see if he can help you or any suggestions. Thanks for being here. Good luck in the upcoming events for the rest of the year, and uh, um, you will hear from me again. I can assure you. I've thought about calling you numerous times, and something come up, and somebody will call, and I'm, we're available. And, but uh, you made it. Yep. Good luck to you. I'm sure that Rich Vogler was looking down and said, boy, this guy knows how to drive a car. Wow. Uh, were any of the, was Rich's sister there? Um, not that I saw. So, so the year before, Eleanor, his mom, was able to make it down. And I know this trip, um, she wasn't able to, to no. make it this summer, but uh, I stayed in pretty close contact through um, the Throckmortons and, and you know, had, had kept, in, kept track of Eleanor that way. So 
Um, always appreciate the chance to see her, but it's it's nice to know that she's still following along. Oh yeah, she didn't come to the speedway this year, but uh, Dale did her. With her sister was here, and her daughter was here, so they still keep an eye on things. Yeah. Good luck to you going the rest of the year, and uh, I'm sure, like everybody else, I'd love to see you in an IndyCar at some point in time. So keep charging. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it much. Thanks again for having me. And Cody Swanson. program is scheduled for um, August 15th, followed on the, by the 29th, or at the 29th. I don't have guests officially signed up yet, but we're working on some uh, drivers and so forth, so I will let you know via email or on Facebook. Uh, so I hope we'll see you then. Until then, Don Casey, thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. Thanks to Casey and to Cody for being here. We'll see you next time. Good night.